You came to me with a torch and a gun. You call it righteousness. Call it by its right name. Murder. Have Gun, Will Travel. Starring Mr. John Daner as Paladin. San Francisco, 1875. The Carlton Hotel, headquarters of the man called Paladin. Come in. Oh, clean socks, Mr. Paladin. Mm -hmm. uh, clean socks for a trip, very important. Oh, yes, thank you. Hey, boy, just put them in the bag there. Yes, sir. Oh, 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 bottle of brandy in bag, too. It's for the trip, very important. Oh, oh snake fight. <laughs> Correct. Oh, no snakes in Nevada territory this time of year. Why not? Too cold. Oh, maybe brandy for other purpose, like uh, drinking? <laughs> maybe. Or maybe to give lady named Cleo to uh, make warm? The lady named Cleo has hired me to do a job, that's all. Oh, sure. She wants me to find her husband. Oh, sure. And she's paying me very well. Oh, sure. Hey, boy. You know what you are? No, what I are? Auf den Knödel. Auf den Knödel? Yes. Now, carry this down to the lobby for me. I'm ready to leave the comforts of the Carlton Hotel and head for the wilds of Nevada. Auf den Knödel. Do you see speed laws and other regulations as restrictive? Or do you look upon them as protective? When a police officer writes a summons for traffic violations, do you see him as an enemy or a friend? Your life may depend on your attitudes. Statistics clearly indicate that where laws are obeyed, deaths go down. It's no secret that emotional immaturity is the major factor in our accident rate. How else but childish can you describe the notion that breaking a traffic regulation is a way of getting away with something? What could be more infantile than believing one can prove his superiority by ignoring a stoplight? Unfortunately, too many drivers on the road subscribe to that kind of emotional outlook. The result is tragic. Almost 85% of all traffic accidents in America are caused by careless, childish driving. We hope you know our traffic laws and the people who enforce them are there to help save your life. A lady named Cleo, whom I had traveled over a thousand miles to help, turned out to be a fat shrew of 50, and her desperate need of me was to find a husband who had understandably tried to blot out his memory of her with drink. By the time I found him, he'd done pretty well. I figured they deserved each other, so I brought him back, memory and all. But I was left in the middle of the Nevada desert, miles from the railroad. I'd been riding for a full day when I heard a strange sound in the desert stillness. Or at least, a strange sound for that lonesome place. It was a baby's cry. And then I saw the wagon. It sat alone, without horses, forlorn in the sand. No sign of life, except the sound. I dismounted and walked toward the wagon. Get away from that wagon. Well, I thought it was deserted. Mister, while you still can. Is this all right? Now get on your horse and ride on. Are you alone here? That don't matter. A woman can't last out here by herself. Where's your man? Clear out, mister. What's that you've been digging? It don't concern you. Is it a grave? Who's it for? The baby and me. Oh, look, I don't know what this is all about, but won't you let me help you? You can't help us none. I can try. You ain't a doctor, are you? No, I'm not. Move on, then. What's wrong with the baby? Typhoid. Typhoid fever. Well, maybe I Hold could have... Hold fast, mister. I'd just as soon shoot you dead as know you got a killing fever from us. But you just can't stay Please, out here mister. and... 
I ain't got the strength to dig another grave. Has the doctor seen your baby? No. Well, then you can't be sure it's typhoid. Mr. Mulrooney knows. Who? Mulrooney, the wagon master. He knows the symptoms. And he just cut you loose? Left you out here to die? He said it was either the baby and me or the whole wagon train. Are they sending help? What can they do? Well, there's a settlement less than a day's ride from here. We'll hitch my horse to the wagon no. and head out. They won't let us in. The wagon train's there by now. They'll know about the typhoid. They'll never let us in, not now. Uh, look, there's fresh water and food in my saddlebag. Enough to hold you till I get back. Where are you going? To get help. Mister, you don't have to do this. Let's just say I want to. Pardon me, ma'am. Yes? They said at the store I'd find a doctor at this house. Yes, that's right. Well, my name is Paladin. I'd like to speak to the doctor, if I may. You are, Mr. Paladin. You're the doctor? Dr. Phyllis Thackeray. Oh, well, how do you do? Didn't they tell you down at the store? Well, there were some looks. I guess people out here haven't got used to the idea of a woman doctor. Most of them won't even believe I am a doctor. Are you? My diploma's inside, if you care to look. Oh, well, no, no, I'm not the patient. Who is, then? A woman and her baby. What's wrong with them? Uh, the baby might have typhoid fever. Might have? Well, I'm not sure. Where are they? They're lying in a wagon a day's ride from here. I see. It's a long ride. You'll find my horse in the stable. By the time you have him saddled, I'll be ready to go. <laughs> You're quite a woman. I'm a doctor, Mr. Paladin. Uh, wait a minute. Oh. Looks like a delegation, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, just a minute, you two. I've got something to say. Yes, Mr. Davis? Mr. You didn't tell us those people had typhoid fever. No, I didn't. Who did? I did. My name is Jeremiah Mulrooney. Well, now, Mulrooney. You don't look like a murderer. Why? You sentenced that woman and her baby to die when you left them out in the desert. They're diseased. You've done nothing to help them? Uh, look, mister, typhoid's a terrible thing. It, it's nothing to fool around with. We don't want it here. He that touches pitch shall be defiled forthwith. You've consorted with the disease. The fever is upon you, too. So, uh, you'd better make tracks, mister. Wait. Mr. Davis, he's not even sure it is typhoid. I'm sure. I saw it. You're not qualified to say. And who says she is? Uh, are you going out there with this man, Miss Thackeray? Well, of course, Mr. Davis. I'm a doctor. All right, that's up to you. But once you mix with a fever, you're not welcome back here. And don't try bringing those fever patients back here, either. If we have to bring them back, we will. Look, we got folks to protect, children of our own. And we'll shoot you down if we have to, to keep them safe. They mean what they say, Mr. Paladin. So do I. You ready to go? I'm ready. Perhaps I wasn't used to the idea of a woman doctor myself, especially one as pretty as Phyllis Thackeray. She rode beside me through the desert, all night, without rest, without complaint. 
Now it was just after sunrise. Maybe I should have brought something for saddle swords. <laughs> you want to rest? I want to get to that baby. Yeah. Shouldn't be long now. Good. You know, you should be on a velvet settee, wearing a hoop skirt and fluttering your eyelash over a fan. I tried that. It was too easy. <laughs> Is that why you studied medicine? This was hard? Maybe. Something like that. Wasn't it tough enough practicing back east? I guess I'm as much missionary as physician. I was the second woman to graduate from my medical school. Others came after me. It was difficult for all of us, but gradually we're becoming accepted as something better than freaks. <laughs> You're not accepted yet. You just got run out of town. Well, maybe I'm not the missionary I think I am. Or the doctor. Well, we'll see. Here's the wagon up ahead. I don't see anybody. Uh, neither do I. Come on. They're in there, all right. Both sleeping. I hope that's what it is. Is there anything I can do? Just help me up there. Right. And cross your fingers. Doctor, coffee's ready. Mm, smells good. The food will be ready in a minute. Here. Well, thanks. How are they? Well, the mother's suffering from exhaustion, exposure, nerves, no sleep. The baby? Typhoid? Well, maybe. I don't know yet. Mulroney knows all the symptoms. So do I. High fever, red spots, delirium, then a coma that leads to the crisis. The baby has all of them. Still, it could be something else. But whatever it is, I can't do much for her in this wilderness. You want to take them back to town? Yes. You know what that means? Yes. It's necessary, medically? Yes. I'll hitch the horses to the wagon. Mr. Paladin. Hmm? You don't have to come with me. I wouldn't miss it. There's something about that Mulrooney's face I didn't like. Stop that wagon right there. Don't come no farther. Whoa. 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 They have guns, Mr. Paladin. I'm going to try to talk some sense into their heads. Here, hold the reins. Stand right there. No closer. Dr. Thackeray has examined the woman and child. The woman has no signs of typhoid. Her child is diseased. The doctor isn't sure the baby has typhoid. I'm sure. That baby needs treatment. Now, Mr. Davis, you're a sensible man. Are you going to let Mulrooney sentence a woman and child to death? We'll bring what you need out here. But you ain't bringing them into town. Uh, They'll be right, completely isolated in the doctor's office. Paladin, they're sick and we can't take the chance. We've got to protect ourselves. They're not as sick as you people. Now, you may be able to keep them out of this settlement. But you'll carry your own sickness with you wherever you go. You'll die again every time you see a baby smile. We've got our own kids to think about. How do your children cry when they're sick? Any different from that baby? Suppose it was your child crying like that. Would you send it to the desert to die? Now listen to me, all of you. I'm driving that wagon right to the doctor's office, and don't you try to stop me. If you need a doctor, you know where she'll be. We won't let you do it, Paladin. We won't let you bring disease and pestilence into our midst. I'm afraid they'll use those guns, Mr. Paladin. Get back there with Mrs. Benson. Both of you lie flat. You gonna try it? Go on, get back. Mr. Paladin, are you all right? Fine, fine, we're through. I'll have you in your office in another minute.
CBS Radio will score another goal on New Year's Day as most of these same stations bring you our play-by-play broadcasts of the two year-end football classics, the Orange Bowl and Cotton Bowl games. From the Orange Bowl, CBS News sports experts will call the thrills in the Oklahoma-Syracuse contest. Syracuse will be making its second appearance at the Orange Bowl this year with an 8-1 record. Sporting a 9-1 record, Oklahoma will make its fourth appearance. There'll be plenty of excitement at the Cotton Bowl, too, where Texas Christian will be battling it out with the Air Force Academy. The Texans have made it with an 8-2 this year, and the Air Force Academy is the Cinderella team of college football, with nine wins, no losses, and one tie to date. No matter where you go, no matter what else you're doing on New Year's Day, here's CBS Radio's on-the-spot broadcast of the Orange Bowl and Cotton Bowl games. All through that night, I sat on her porch and kept watch, seeing their torches, hearing the voice of Mulrooney haranguing the townspeople, working them up. But they didn't come. And inside, the doctor worked with her patience. It was after dawn when she came out to me. Still quiet? Oh, well. Mulroney is still working on them like a witch doctor. There's breakfast inside. You'd better eat something. I'll stand guard for a while. Thanks. How's Mrs. Benson? She'll be all right after she gets some rest. And the baby? The fever broke last night. Oh, what does that mean? It isn't typhoid. Not typhoid? You sure? Yes. Well, how can you be certain? You've only been with her overnight. You still doubt me, don't you, Mr. Paladin? The symptoms are there. Symptoms can be ambiguous. Now get your breakfast. You need it. All right. Morning, Mr. Paladin. Well, Mrs. Benson. It's nice to see you up and around. Wish I could tell you how much I appreciate it. Oh, no, no. No gratitude before breakfast. Baby's better, huh? Yes, much better. Miss hmm. Benson. Hmm? Why does Mulroney hate you so much? Um, my husband died early on the trip. After a while, Mulroney wanted me to marry him said it was God's will to care for widows, and he was the chosen messenger. I wouldn't let him near me. Then the baby got sick. Come outside. What is it? They're coming. Look. I'll handle them. Go inside with Mrs. Benson. No, maybe I can help. You take care of your patients. You may have some new ones. I want to stay. All right, but stand back. That's far enough, Mulrooney. This torch is the fire of truth and justice, Paladin. It will burn away the seeds that Clara Benson has spread among us. It will scourge the disease from our souls and bodies and purify these homes again. The only disease is in you, Mulrooney. Mrs. Benson is well, and the baby is out of danger. Lies! In the very face of judgment... Mulroney, I'm giving you 15 seconds to drop that torch and call off those rifles. The flames of the just will banish this scourge. Let the fires rage in the land of... You have 10 seconds. Wait! Listen, all of you. That baby never had typhoid fever. Don't believe her. I saw the child raging with fever, living with rash. That rash was measles! Three-day measles! You're lying. Three-day measles, Mr. Mulrooney. And you left them to die because of it. Mrs. Benson, bring the baby out. No, it's not true. You're trying to humiliate me, to belittle me. You'll see. All of you. The fever is down. The rash has faded. Her eyes are bright. There, look. Look at her, Mulrooney. You can kill people with hate. But not with three-day measles. <laughs> Mulrooney, three-day measles. <laughs> Stop! Stop it! You can't laugh at me! Stop! Paladin! Mulrooney, don't 
be a fool. I'm going to kill you, paladin. I'm going to laugh at your grave. Let me see. There's no need. I think he's dead. You shoot very straight. Mr. Paladin. What do you want? Mr. Paladin. Well, I, I guess we was wrong to listen to him. He, he seemed to have so much book learning. But he was just setting us against each other. I'm glad we woke up in time. Next time, you better wake up a little sooner. Dr. Thackeray, this town hasn't been too good for you. Maybe you'd like to come along with me. They can always use a good doctor in San Francisco. Oh, please, ma'am. I guess we ain't been very friendly, but we'll make it up to you if you'll forgive us and stay. Well, Dr. Thackeray? Thanks, Mr. Paladin, for your offer. But there are too many of those velvet settees in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. I'll stay here where I'm needed. Oh, good afternoon, Mr. Paladin. Good afternoon, hey boy. You get in late last night. Uh, sleep all day. Now up, I'm feeling fine. I do indeed. Boy, oh, you have good time with Lady Cleo? Lady Cleo? Lady will send for you, mm. you know. Oh, <laughs> as a matter of fact, I'd forgotten about her. Oh, sure. Uh, I met a lady who was much more charming. A lady doctor. Oh, sure. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I've had a fine case of three-day measles. Oh, yeah, the three-day measles. Oh, sure. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> oh, uh, you got dirty laundry. Uh, you put out tonight. Uh, to coin a phrase, hey, boy. Oh, Sure. Have Gun, Will Travel. Created by Herb Meadow and Sam Rolfe. Is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and stars John Daner as Paladin, with Ben Wright as Hayboy. Tonight's story was written by Don Brinkley and adapted for radio by John Dunkel. Featured in the cast were Virginia Gregg, Vic Perrin, Gene Bates, and Lou Krugman. Hugh Douglas speaking. Join us again next week for Have Gun, Will Travel. <laughs> <laughs>